What's poorly introducing my podcast? I'm Robert Evans, host of Behind the Bastards, the podcast with the worst introductions in the podcasting game, and also the podcast where we talk about the worst people in all of history. So the introductions are at least uh, in line with the terribleness of the human beings we talk about. My guest today is conflict journalist uh, and host and operator of Popular Front, uh, which is a, a podcast about... Uh, the nerdy modern details of war. Uh, Jake Hanrahan, how you doing, Jake? Hello, mate. Good, good, good. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you and I, we just spent uh, closing in on two weeks in mm-hmm. uh, Iraq and Syria together a little bit earlier this year. Yeah, um, yeah. And we talked to a lot of nice people there. And today we're going to talk about somebody who sucks. Yeah, are yeah. You? Old Tommy boy. <laughs> yeah, Tommy Robinson. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, how would you describe Tommy Robinson in like a sentence or two to just someone who who wanted a quick description of who this dude is? He's like this like hard right wing quasi football hooligan. <laughs> He's yeah. become kind of a joke, um, but is also you know has caused hell for the last like god man like ten years. I remember in school even hearing about him, just being like, who the fuck is this guy? You know. Yeah, he's been at this shit a while. He's kind of like like a low rent Oswald Mosley. Um, yeah, really, yeah. really low rent. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and Oswald Mosley was not a high rent Oswald Mosley. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like the Woodlouse of the Oswald Mosleys. You know, it's it's yeah. down there. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I'm gonna get into it. So yeah. Uh, you know, I'm just going to read this story, and uh, and and you'll comment. And you know, one of your side jobs here, Jake, is mm-hmm. going to be to mock me viciously when I mispronounce one of your country's ridiculous city names. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one I, I keep having trouble with. It looks like Leicester, but I know that's wrong. Leicester, Leicester. Mm-hmm. It's absurd. <laughs> that actually is absurd, but it's it, that's like my area, man. Like East Midlands. Mm-hmm. It's down yeah. the road. It looks like Leicester or something, but yeah, it's Leicester. Yeah, Leicester. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we will be talking about the Midlands uh, at a couple of points My today. My favorite. Um, yeah, yeah, that is uh, where some of this is set. So, uh, Stephen Christopher Yaxley was born on November 27th, 1982 in Lutton, England. Is it Luton or Lutton? Luton, Luton. Luton, Luton. Yeah. Luton. In Luton, England. Uh, in interviews, he tends to focus on the fact that his parents were both Irish immigrants into the country. He later told The Telegraph, everything in Luton is the son of immigrants, whether it be Irish, West Indian, Ghanaian, everyone I know. His mom worked at a bakery, and his dad worked at a Vohal car plant in Luton. I've never heard of that manufacturer, but they're uh, defunct now, I guess. But yeah, it was like a big industrial employer in the town. As an adult, Yaxley has repeatedly emphasized the level of poverty and hopelessness that was endemic to the community he grew up in. In 2016, he self-published an autobiography titled Enemy of the State, uh, which I have not read because I didn't want to give this guy money since it was a self-published book. However, I did read a number of reviews of the book. Uh, one of them was a surprisingly positive review by a guy named Daniel Falconer, who's at the a book reviewer for the London School of Economics. He chastised the book's flawed and inaccurate analysis of Islam, but he praised Tommy Robinson's writing on the economic state he and his peers grew up in, writing, quote, That portrait is bleak indeed. Economic vulnerability, social breakdown, and political neglect are themes that surface time and again. Importantly, the drug use, crime, and serious violence that frequently accompany these broader problems are never abstract for Robinson. They are lived realities for him and for his broader community, and he is not shy of describing them in disturbing detail, because... As he says, these things are bound to have shaped me in some way. Growing up, hearing the stories and experiencing the reality of life on the streets, you couldn't help but have it touch your life in some way or another. Yeah. And that's, um, I don't know, like you you talk, when we were chatting about like where you come up, you Mm. talked a lot about like the the kind of poverty in that particular chunk of, uh, of the UK, which is not the chunk that I think, you know, most Americans, it's like London. Yeah, Um, yeah. It's kind of what you hear about, but yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it, there is one thing you can say that, like, I, d- he is right about that, that, like, how bad the, you know, I live where he's from. It's like three train stops away, you know, like 40 minutes, and there's not a lot of difference, you know. It's my area, my where he's Luton, that's like outer London, but I'm Midlands, but still it's, it's just it, the kind of deprivation is just unlike anything you can really think of because it's it's not like so bad that it's like dystopian or anything but it's just 
just so boring. There's just nothing to do. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. the only thing people do is like, you know, basically when you come out of school, you're either going to work in the factory or be a drug dealer. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's grim. Yeah. And it seems like one of the few things to do, uh, outside of those occupations is, is get into fights over whatever it is you find to get into fights over. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And that's 100%. a big part yeah <laughs> like in school for um, me like just growing up it was just I, I mean i got my head kicked in so many times just from like you know just just that was what happened you would just they you hit a certain age and it's just right you fight now you know what i mean it's weird man it's not nice yeah yeah it sounds it sounds shitty and it sounds like uh uh tommy robinson had similar kind of experiences in his uh in his upbringing although i should note uh, that several reporters have found evidence that Robinson comes from a more well-off background than he tends to portray himself. He definitely spent a lot of time in Luton or Luton and Luton, like yeah. grew up there as a kid. Um, but there's also evidence that like his family was one of the wealthier families in the area. Uh, Emma Moss Lee, reporting for Vice, spoke to several people who grew up with and around him. One of those sources claimed that he. Uh, came up quite well off as a result of his stepfather's family business, which was like a plumbing business. So it kind of seems like he was one of the more well-off people in a very poor area. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but like, yeah, um, perhaps, but even, you know, <laughs> even being well-off around these areas, it's not it's not the well-off that you would think. Like, certainly yeah. he's not in the Hamptons, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and he clearly had the same issue with, like, nothing to do, so, yeah, like, why not yeah. fight? Yeah. yeah. Now, in his autobiography, Tommy recalls uh, growing up with an assortment of non-white friends, particularly Muslims. Uh, I found a very positive review of his autobiography by a far-right uh, author on Medium. Uh, the article is titled Night of the Realm, which is how the guy refers to Tommy Robinson. Here's how that writer summarized Tommy's recollection of his childhood friend group. Quote, in the book, he describes his early years of a bright yet lad racing through unchallenging schoolwork, easily distracted and always up for a scuffle. Already in his teens, he saw Muslim friends he'd grown up with reach an age and then drift away into big groups of Muslim youths. But a commonplace playground tussle would see dozens of Muslim men arrive soon after, brawls, injuries, and the police called. Um, now, this is like an angle that Robinson pushes a lot in his media appearance, this idea that like as a kid he came to realize that whenever there were fights, Muslims reacted with a group mentality and they would all uh, habitually defend each other. I found another quote from Tommy Robinson this time uh, in a Telegraph article stating, quote, the mentality they have, I realized when I went to the World Cup, when an Englishman out there gets in trouble, every other Englishman defends him. It's the mindset, you're away from home and he's your brother. And that's a brotherhood they have every day. You get in trouble outside a nightclub here, they'll get out of their taxis, their chicken shops, they'll come from everywhere. They don't need to know each other just because they're a Muslim and you're not so a, yeah mm, okay something's yeah <laughs> i mean i don't know about that man like <laughs> yeah that's yeah. bullshit like well i don't know maybe it's, luton is a very very different place actually to where i'm there's not even a mosque in my town you know what i mean um yeah. oh that actually there is but it's very small and it's just like they also use it for uh, other things as well you know what i mean so uh, he's definitely I, I don't know. yeah He's, He's an unreliable a, narrator. Yeah, yeah, but. yeah, a little bit. I think, <laughs> you, I mean, you know, if your mate gets punched up, I don't think that someone's just going to be like, wait, hang on, he's a Muslim, so I'll defend him. Like, it's, you yeah. know, round here, it's factional between your friends. It's more your friendship group than anything like that from what I've ever seen, man. Like, I don't know. Yeah, you know, and I, I could see, uh, like, people kind of hanging to friendship groups that are based heavily around race, because that kind of happens in a lot of places, and yeah, like that true. being what... But I can't see him getting into a fight outside of a nightclub and some guy leaving his kebab shop to just be like, well, it's time to go beat the shit out of <laughs> yeah, somebody. Yeah, like, see, my spidey senses are tingling. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe <laughs> now just because everyone fucking hates him, you know what I mean? But, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's kind of create. I, certainly, I do think there's a lot of truth to what he's saying in that sense. But I think he's also like creating his own um, perfect version of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. At this point, I, I have no trouble imagining people crossing the street to get in a shot at him. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we'll explain why over the course of this episode. Um, so that Telegraph article also includes the claim that Stephen did very well in high school, scoring eleven ACs in something called the GCSE, which I assume is just uh, British school test stuff yeah uh, GCSE is like what you do and then you go on to college so it's the first right. big exam 
Uh, yeah, and he did not go on to college, but he he claims repeatedly everywhere that you'll find him talking to media that he did very well in uh, in like his school stuff up until that point. Um, and, uh, he also will usually emphasize that he never needed to study. Um, and I, it's one of those things where this is in like every article where Tommy talks about his childhood. And to my knowledge, none of the journalists who repeat this have actually gotten any records and stuff. And I assume that's kind of difficult to do because that stuff's usually, uh, it's like there probably would be no way to get his high school grades or whatever mm. but like i don't know it's a claim that is repeated that we can't back up but it's definitely important for tommy that you know that he did very well in school before he dropped out at 16 mm. um, i mean that i mean maybe i mean certainly i yeah, maybe i wouldn't yeah. know how to even get my g's i think i got one gcse and i wouldn't even know how to get the paper for it to be honest so yeah 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 yeah, I mean it's it's not weird that he there's not backup for that. Mm-hmm. Um and he's he's clearly got a type of intelligence, so I wouldn't be surprised if he did do all right in school. Yeah. Um now in that telegraph interview, Tommy acknowledged that he had problems outside of school, and primarily those problems were his growing love of soccer hooliganism. Uh, as a very young lad, he got involved with the Men in Gear, or MIGs, which uh, were apparently an infamous Luton uh, town football gang. One of its leaders and uh, most hooligany hooligans was a guy who used the nickname Tommy Robinson. The constant street fights were a hallmark of Stephen's childhood, and they were also the first time he wound up in direct confrontation with Muslims. He told the Telegraph, Look, when I was at school, Imran and Cameron, two identical twins, were some of my best mates, but there were problems with Muslim gangs, and there were fights between the English lads and the Muslims. Whenever you get in a problem at school, it's flooded with Muslim men. They always seem to be waiting for trouble. Um, so again, that's like a line that just, he, he, he makes that point a lot about the, the, the way that he thinks these people react. Um, now, for what it's worth, that Vice profile uh, claim talked to some other people who grew up around Tommy and claims that his falling out with those twins uh, wasn't a result of them joining a gang, but was because they didn't invite him to a wedding. Um, so who knows? Mm. Uh, in 1995, when Tommy was 11 and still named Stephen, a 29-year-old man named Mark Sharp was beaten to death by a group of five Muslim men while getting kebab for his daughter. The killing seems to have been tied to road rage rather than any racial motivation, but the fact that the attackers were from Bangladesh uh, made it an inciting incident for racists in the area. Um, I don't know, is that one you heard about, Mark Sharp's murder? Yeah, I know about it because, I mean... To be honest, um, it's not a lie that, like, there's certain groups that it's like, okay, like, don't mess with them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. And, it, you know, and it's like Bangladeshis, um, the Somalians, like, you know, the gangs, it's like, don't fuck with them. So there is an element of truth to the fact that, yeah, there are, like, these kind of gangs of, of certain ethnicities, and it's like, you know, they will just stab you to bits. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's not based oh, yeah. on racism. It's just based on what has been happening around the area for decades. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't seem like the Mark Sharp case was a, a result of that. Like, it seems like this guy got into some traffic stuff. Yeah, with yeah. Them like, you can just get followed. stabbed yeah. to bits for nothing here. Like, you know, yeah. people are, yeah. like, literally just want to stab you for nothing. It's, it's, it's so sick. It's disgusting. Yeah, see, here in the um, in the civilized United States, we just shoot people. <laughs> yeah, much, yeah, you guys, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're more gentlemanly, you know. We look our, our enemies in the face and just stab them and run off, yeah. Yeah, we, we kind of spray and pray with an AR-15 into a crowd. So, yeah, I guess I prefer y'all's way, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we got acid attacks, actually. So, well, you do you know, have those. That's, that's a big one now, yeah. That's I in. Really- yeah, yeah, that's a big one in the UK, and I'm I'm super excited for when somebody finally synthesizes a drone with an acid attack. That's gonna be a, <sighs> a great day. Yeah, yeah, it's fucked. It will happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it will absolutely happen. Um, so yeah, Stephen left school at 16. Uh, the Telegraph just notes that despite his academic ability, nobody encouraged Robinson to stay on for sixth form. Rather than continue his academic career, Tommy decided to apply to study aircraft engineering at the Lytton Airport. The Vohal plant where his father worked had closed down right around the same time he graduated, and the airport was basically the only blue-collar game left in town. 
Now, the Vohal plant closing may have had an impact on young Stephen's attitudes towards Muslims. In decades past, Lytton had been a major hub of industry, which had drawn in a large immigrant population. Stephen's mother's family had immigrated in from Ireland, and throughout his childhood, increasing numbers of Pakistani and Bangladeshi Muslims had also moved in. By the year 2000, when Stephen was 18 and the factory closed, Muslims made up 15% of Lytton's population. Um, today, they make up like a quarter, and Lutton is one of the very few British towns where white Britons are an ethnic minority. So, like, right as jobs are getting tight and his dad loses his job is when there's, like, this flood of uh, of immigrants in from, like, Muslim-speaking countries. So it's one of those things where Tommy doesn't claim that haven't had an impact, but you look at it and you're like, yeah, that seems like it might have had an impact. Yeah, um, I mean, it would piss you off, right? Like you're some like kind yeah. of angry young man, and that happens. It would piss you off. I, I think the thing with Luton is that there's the difference. So I, I look at it and I think, oh, I don't know, but like where I live, it's so small that like if you're broke, if you're poor, you're just poor. It's not like oh, you're in the Muslim bit or you're the black bit or the white bit. Like everyone's on top of each other, so you don't really care. You're just like whatever. Like we're all together. But in places like Luton, it's big enough but also like condensed enough to be able to have segregated areas. Do you see what I'm saying? So you can have a Muslim area and the white area and the black area. So there's definitely like animosity between all them kind of groups down there. You know what I'm saying? So I can see that something like that, you could then, he could then go like, oh, it was because of those lot over there. You know what I mean? Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, like there's definitely a small segregation there. Um, yeah. And uh, Stephen studied carefully at the uh, the 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 Luton Airport, and I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going back and forth on that one, I'm sure. And uh, managed to win a coveted apprenticeship in aircraft engineering. Uh, this was quite an achievement. Over 600 people applied to the job, and Stephen was one of only four who got in. Uh, in 2003, after five years of study, he qualified for the job, but he only actually held it for about two years. Uh, because he got in a spot of legal trouble. Uh, now, most mainstream news sources, including Vice, kind of breezed past this part of his backstory. Here's what they wrote in their write-up. Almost immediately, his life was turned upside down when a criminal conviction during a drunken argument, he assaulted a man who ter- turned out to be an off-duty police officer, meant he lost his job. Now, that's a really weirdly passive way of writing about that. Um and, uh, yeah, I, I just found that strange, so I went searching for a little bit more detail. Mm. Um, and there's a couple of people who cover the um, uh, uh, the attack in a little bit more detail. Now, we'll talk about that in a second. Vice also notes that roughly a year before this incident, Yaxley joined the British National Party, or BNP. Uh, yeah, and the BNP is an outright fascist party. It yeah, has its uh, own completely. Party. Yeah. The, the guy that like um, that ran it was a part of NF National Front, which was an yeah. openly uh, white supremacist, even Nazi group back in the eighties. Yeah, they're complete scum. Yeah, they're complete scum. They have a, a paramilitary mob with them called Combat Eighteen. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The the eighteen is a reference to the name of Adolf Hitler because the first letters of his first and last name are the first and eighth letters of the alphabet. Um, and that group's been tied to a lot of murders. And as far as we know, Robinson wasn't a member of Combat Eighteen, uh, but he did join the BNP. And f- again, this is kind of weird. Most mainstream sources I read who wrote profiles on him kind of let Robinson whitewash this. Um, like, here's here's exactly how Vice uh, describes it. Quote, Robinson describes his dalliances with hooliganism, as well as a brief stint as a BNP member in 2004, as useful missteps. And they never, like, go any deeper into it. So I, I found that a little bit peculiar. Um, and uh, it, there's the a little bit more... <laughs> Robinson can't ignore this entirely because it's one of people's big claims when they they claim that he's a fascist. Um, And in his autobiography, the way he sort of whitewashes this is that he claims that he joined the BNP because he wanted to stand up to the Muslim gangs. And during the first meeting, he brought along a black friend. And when he saw how racist they were to his black friend, he left the meeting uh, and realized that the BNP was bad, which I'm pretty certain is a lie. Um... And there's some some evidence that suggests why. Uh, I found a write-up on Stephen Yaxley Lennon in the uh, anti-fascist magazine Searchlight, which was a uh, uh, a project of a charity called Hope Not Hate. And this is the like this write-up on him is the write-up that like 
revealed his actual name as Stephen Yaxley Lennon because he goes by Tommy Robinson, which is there's a couple of different names this dude has, and mm. it's actually kind of hard to pin down which is his original. But that write up of him goes into his backstory and notes quote In 2004, he joined the BNP with a family membership. In the same year, he assaulted an off duty police officer who intervened to stop a domestic in- incident between Yaxley Lennon and his partner, Jenna Vowles. During the scuffle, Yaxley Lennon kicked the officer in the head. He was convicted in April 2005 for assault occasioning a, a actual bodily harm for which he was sentenced to 12 months imprisonment and assault with intent to resist arrest for which he received a concurrent term of three months. Vowles was also a BNP member and was cautioned for possession of cocaine. So that's a different picture than I found kind of painted of him in the, uh, you know, in the Vice article is not like positive towards Robinson, but it doesn't dig into this stuff. Like that's a different case if this dude's got a family membership in the BNP, that's a real different story right there from just a guy who slides into a meeting and then slides out of it. Yeah, like um, family membership. I didn't even know such a thing existed, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's what these folks claim is the case, and they've been right about other details of his backstory. Oh, yeah, no, I, I can yeah. believe it. Like, I just didn't yeah. even know. Like, you, would, yeah. it's the sort of thing you would think... Yeah, it's, it, it seems a little bit deeper than like, oh, let me just go and talk to these guys for a minute, you know? Yeah, oh, they didn't like my black friend. Yeah. Maybe these Nazis Surprise. are racist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's also like that assault. I, it's like it's weird how passive the write-ups usually are. It's like he assaulted someone who turned out to be an undercover cop. It's like, no, he was abusing his girlfriend and this cop walked up and he kicked him in the head. Like, yeah, yeah, that, that's <laughs> like, I think, I'm sure that happened another time as well, like, them basically, like from what I understand, they're they're just huge cokeheads. And in fact, even the oh, like yeah. alt right have accused him of spending like all the money on coke and stuff. You know, that would not surprise me. <laughs> and is also like kind of the same with the uh, a lot of the fascists in uh in in Portland and stuff. Like a really? lot of the Proud Boys and Patriot Prayer. Yeah, there's a lot of rumors and a couple of like former members who have alleged like yeah, the ringleaders speed spend all of the money they crowdfund on blow, mm. and after all of these rallies, they have big coke parties. It just it turns out a lot of people who like to fight and do cocaine are also interested in far right politics. Yeah, well, it's just a heady mix, eh? Hey? <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, surprising. Um, So, Stephen Yaxley, that's still what he's going by at this point, spent Mm -hmm. around a year in jail. When he got out, he opened a tanning salon in Luton and moved to (laughs) Bedford. (laughs) I keep keep fucking it up, don't I? No, no, I'm laughing at the tanning salon. (laughs) Oh, yeah, he opened a tanning salon. (laughs) What? (laughs) Oh, I didn't even know that, you know. Oh, man. Yeah, okay. and he moved to Bedford, which is a town with near uh, Luton with an average family income, though, of around a quarter of a million dollars. So he's clearly doing a lot pretty well at this uh, point. I, I tell you um, what, Bedford is literally like, I don't know, f- an hour drive, if that. No, it's like 40 minutes away from me. Like, Bedford is pretty poor, you okay. know? Oh, weird. Okay, so that's just yeah, a situation I, I mean, where there's Bedford some rich people. Is, yeah, yeah, like moving to Bedford is certainly not a step up. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah. See, that's, there, there are uh, nice areas. Don't get me wrong. You know, but um, yeah. nah. It's hard to tell. It's just because all I can look at is like what the average sort of uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's there why is, it's but... kind of it's hard to tell, right? It's um yeah, yeah. It's it's a good job. There's a uh, you know it's a good job I've been there because yeah, it's not yeah. the best place. But certainly, right. like if he managed to yeah. start his own business, I imagine he had a bit of money coming in. Yeah, and his stepfather, you know, they had hard times after his uh, his stepfather got laid off from the Vohal plant, but he opened up a plumbing business, which mm. seems to have been very successful, um, and where uh, Stephen also worked, and um, he also made cash buying, renovating, and flipping houses during this period. Wow, so it's, okay. It, yeah, it, it seems like he's doing really well, actually, yeah. and making a very comfortable income at this period of time in his life. Uh, now, that does not last super long because of some events that occur in 2009 and we will talk about that but first Jake we have to break for your very favorite thing ads uh. <laughs> now now Jake you don't do ads on your show but are is there any product you would like to provide a free ad plug for today um a product or concept yeah product a concept popular front activity. pretty good concept <laughs> <laughs> That is a good concept. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I would just say um, don't do drugs, get fit, and care about nature. There you go. 
Well, you were the first person saying don't do drugs on this podcast. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, and okay. I, I will say this is one area where we we disagree with. Yeah, but yeah. I, I agree <laughs> with getting fit and enjoying nature. Absolutely, so. man. <laughs> <laughs> and donating to Popular Front yeah, also man. a good also a good idea. You should also donate to um, the corporations that ads. And we're back. Uh, that was a not one of my better ad transitions. But <laughs> they're all kind of like that. So, you know, when we left off Stephen Yaxley, or Stephen Yaxley Lennon, uh, whatever his actual name is, he's uh, he's doing pretty well. He's gotten out of jail after, a, 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 in the scale of things, a pretty minor assault. And uh, he's got a business, and he seems to be making very good money. Um, but then in 2009, things start to change for him. Um, and this starts when a group called the Royal Anglian Regiment, which is a British military unit who'd been stationed in Afghanistan, rotated home from deployment. Now, since many of them came from the, uh, the Lutton area, there was a homecoming parade for them in the town. And this did not sit well with members of a local Islamic extremist organization, uh, Allah Sunna Wal Jama. Mm. Uh, they held a counter demonstration wielding signs that said Anglian soldiers butchers of Basra, Anglian soldiers, cowards, killers, extremists, and similar things. Uh, they shouted that the returning soldiers were child killers and generally did their best to troll the people of Luton. Now, this small demonstration was immediately condemned and disavowed by us, other Muslim groups in the area, but that didn't stop it as act, from acting as a radicalizing catalyst for local right-wing extremists. A write-up by the University of Northampton notes, quote, the small Islamist protest was specifically designed to both be offensive and provocative. Although numbering no more than 20 protagonists, it offered the perfect opportunity for an instance of tit-for-tat radicalization to develop in the town. Um, which is very much what you see, is this kind of like, there will be there, there will be these extremist Muslim groups that will like recruit people, in some cases for actual, like for the Taliban or whatever, and more often just sort of... Um, say really, if like, kind of like the Westboro Baptist Church in the U.S., where that, like that is exactly yeah. that's such a good way of describing it. Actually, yeah, yeah. it's like jihad yeah. Westboro Baptist. To be honest, man, we had like a good five years in England where we just had a real problem with these hate preachers, man. Like it was a nightmare. You would see them all the time, and they really, really did the worst thing possible because it did it did radicalize a lot of people. You know, people that perhaps didn't yeah. really know any Muslims or like didn't really care about them either way would then see these people and then be like oh like oh and then then you know what i mean and then the ball starts rolling into this kind of radical stuff it was really bad man yeah yeah and that's exactly what happens here and that like but it happens to this whole town as a result of this like the 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 kind of series of events that this group like starts into being mm. um, the extremist Muslim protest of the Anglian soldiers homecoming led to a huge amount of press coverage, which riled up local hooligans and provided an opportunity for right wing extremists to organize them in counter demonstrations. One of those extremists was a dude named Paul Ray. Now Paul is an anti-Muslim blogger who wrote under the pseudonym Lionheart and would later be found <sighs> to have had ties with Anders Brevik. Yeah. The Utoria shooter. You've heard of Paul Ray. Yeah, man. So like, I, I really, really went deep into the Anders Breivik stuff years ago mm -hmm. and yeah he I don't there's no one quite knows what his role was but it yeah. does seem like there was something some kind of connection to Breivik yeah and there's yeah I, I haven't been, I haven't you know I, obviously I was digging on Tommy so I didn't get deep mm -hmm. into Paul I didn't find like a clear connection but it's like a lot of people say they were definitely in communication there was some sort of role the guy had right and Brady um, claims to have met a British guy called Lionheart if I remember rightly mm -hmm. you know it's just all very yeah. dodgy but again yeah the, like his I, I read his manifesto which it, the whole thing is bonkers it's made up of like fifty oh, different yeah. things so you never know you know but possibly. If I'm if I'm if I'm criticizing manifestos on quality, it's definitely one of the lower writing quality <laughs> of, of the, the of the murderous. Ones, yeah. yeah, it's one of the worst yeah. manifestos. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, now Ted Kaczynski, that guy could write a fucking manifesto. Hey, like Uncle yeah. Ted, man, solid manifesto. Oh, man. <laughs> solid manifesto. <laughs> really like the gold standard yeah, of trying to radicalize people with extremist Five stars, politics. You know. <laughs> so um so this guy Paul Ray, who we were just talking about, helps organize a rejoinder protest to the um the initial like Muslim counter protest of the the homecoming parade. And he gets about 150 activists to show up in April of 2009. Uh, and I'm going to quote now from that University of Northampton write-up on the founding of the English Defense League, which is the group Tommy's about to found. Quote, 
At this point, the demonstration included figures previously linked to the extreme right-wing group Combat 18, symptomatic of the wider far-right's early interest in the Lutton area at this time. The next demonstration in Lutton came on the 24th of May. This protest developed when another nationalist protesting organization, March for England, MFE, began to organize a protest directed primarily against one of the local Islamists present at the 10th of March demonstration, Saiful Islam. In the lead-up to the event, a mosque linked to Saiful Islam was the target of an arson attack, which is revealing of the growing anti-Muslim tensions within the town during the EDL's initial year of formalization. After securing permission to hold this event, MFE formally withdrew, although the march still went ahead with smaller, unofficial MFE presence. The event resulted in a more violent confrontations. A breakaway group targeted Muslim areas of Luton, which itself inspired a counter-response by around 150 young Muslims. So that's the tit-for-tat stuff like we're seeing. Like the keep Different groups start holding these rallies. People get assaulted, you know, right-wing extremists assault Muslims, then like some young Muslims will assault you know, white people or right-wing extremists or whoever, like they credit as being that, and like it just leads to more and more fighting. It's the same thing we've seen up in like Portland. It's just kind of yeah. what happens when this shit goes down. It got really violent though, man. Like it was crazy. There were like big, yeah. big groups, you know. It yeah, spread yeah. so fast over the region as well. Like it spread, man. Like it ended up even there was uh, like when I was just finishing school, there was a few people were like we're EDL and like you know we would fight with them, but but like it was kind of a foreign like you know like right wing Nazi stuff or whatever or whatever it was was like a really weird concept in our town and in a lot of towns. But now they kind of set the groundwork. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was awful. yeah, and it just hasn't quite go it's like ebbed and flowed since then but it hasn't gone away and it exactly. does like over, yeah yeah so the process continued for several weeks and culminated in the founding of the english defense league that summer now the edl as it's most commonly known held their first event on august 8th this was widely seen as being a dog whistle to british neo-nazis since august 8th is 8 8 and if you listen to this podcast regularly you know what double eights mean to neo-nazis some organizers of the edl including paul ray actually pulled out of the event because of the dog whistling ray stated anybody with the slightest bit of knowledge about neo-nazism knows the meaning of 8 8 which is why i pulled out of any active participation so <laughs> paul ray decides that the the edl is too nazi for him to be around um yeah yeah, well, Paul Ray was from a different kind of strand. He was right. um, like far right, sure, but like anti-Nazi because he's like a Christian. You know what I mean? Like yeah. a real Christian fundamentalist type, like crusaders and all of that shit. So certainly he's like a far right guy, but he was like not involved with the Nazi stuff. It's not like he was like, that's too much for me. I think it was just like, oh, that's not my that's not my thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's not my cup of, cup of tea. Yeah, it's not my yeah. cup of racism. You know, I want the other yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, someone who did not pull out of active participation in the rally was Stephen Yaxley, who at that point adopted the moniker Tommy Robinson. Now, he started out as just kind of one of a couple of prominent people at early EDL protests. Uh, he would always wear a mask, and he was kind of, the clothing he wore, wore was very identifiable. Um, and he gradually kind of wound up in control of the largest group of hooligans within, within this, like, forming organization as they carried out anti-Muslim rallies and had a bunch of street fights. Um, and so, you know, by the time the EDL is a formal thing, Tommy Robinson is its head. Um, so calling him the founder might not be accurate, but he's certainly like the guy who winds up in charge of it once it becomes like a real concrete organization. Um, now, in the offing of it, the British na fascist right community saw the EDL as a useful tool for directing activists towards more extreme groups like the BNP and National Front. However, the EDL's more moderate appearance and more diverse membership allowed it to accrue vastly more public sympathy and support than any explicitly fascist organization ever could. As the months went on, Tommy Robinson made the wise decision to explicitly reject the Nazi roots of his organization, at one point burning a swastika flag on BBC Newsnight as a symbolic rejection of the ideology. Um, and this this works. The, the, the EDL actually spreads very rapidly at this point, uh, and Facebook was utterly critical to that. Robinson was very effective, though, at building a grassroots movement. Um, you know, there was uh, no real clear political ideology in the EDL in its early days, just a hatred for radical Islam and uh, probably more than anything, a desire to get into street fights. Yeah, um, yeah. like yeah. certainly, you know, EDL 
it's it's you know Tommy is not a Nazi. You know what I mean? He yeah, might yeah, be a yeah. fascist now, but yeah, that's you're right. Like there, like certainly what he did there, it wasn't like he was hiding it. He, that you're right. Like the way he got it to spread was because you know he's not a Nazi. People to you know to this day, people are very aware of you know the the sacrifices the troops uh, yeah. of our country gave to fight the Nazis. So it's never been as huge as you might think. You know what I mean? So he was clever in you know. Firstly, he was he was honest that he's not a Nazi but secondly he was clever in being like hey we're not racist or Nazi anyone can join and that yeah that's what made it spread man like I, I knew a lad one of my friend's brothers who's half Pakistani was like oh I might join it and we were like are you mad do you know what I mean and he was like no man they're not racist like you know and and it was do you know what I mean it really a lot yeah. of kids really started to believe it you know yeah, yeah, and that's, I mean, that that's part of, like, because you've obviously, you've seen the same thing with, like, the Proud Boys um, yeah. and with Patriot Prayer here in Portland where, like, they always focus on, like, you know, let, let's get our black members and our Asian members up front so that, and, you know, when that group American Guard tried to drive an armored bus into downtown Portland, this is a group that's been tied to nine murders and is very much, like, a serious extremist white supremacist group. Yeah. The guy who was swinging a hammer at people during the rally was an Asian man. So, mm. like, I mean, and that goes, like, that's, um... It's not an ineffective tactic uh, to sort of like, no, 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 we're not Nazis. Like, look at how much more racially accepting we are than Nazis. And yeah, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't call uh, Tommy Robinson a Nazi. I think he might be a fascist. I think more than anything, he's a grifter. But you know, yeah, that's same, kind of the story same, we're yeah. telling today. Yeah, he's I'd, like he's like a, a grifter that's like you know pretty racist. <laughs> he's just like I yeah. think that's what it is to certain people. It's, I, I go back and forth on a lot of these guys. I do think Steve Bannon's a true believer, um, whatever you want to call him politically. I think he believes it. Yeah, I same. think Gavin McGinnis probably believes a lot of it because he could have pretty easily pulled himself away from this group before it got into legal trouble. I don't mm -hmm. think it's profitable anymore. I don't know. I don't really know Gavin that well. Um, but I ha that's my suspicion is that he believes more than a guy like Tommy does. But I, I, I agree. really don't yeah, know. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read a uh, quote from a 2018 BBC write-up about the uh, the EDL's growth in from like 2009 up through 2011. Quote: Each event appeared to draw a bigger crowd. By 2011, the group had gathered sufficient support to prompt police to close Luton Town Center for a day to facilitate the EDL's homecoming protest. But Robinson's campaign was also unraveling because of his inability to control his followers or his own behavior. Later that year, he received a 12-month community rehabilitation order after a massive football brawl between supporters of his beloved Luton Town FC and those of Newport County. As the fists flew, he led his followers in a chant of EDL till I die. Um, and I, I will remind our American listeners that when you people talk about football, you mean soccer. Well, we mean football. <laughs> <laughs> we mean football. You mean soccer. <laughs> uh, I One of my favorite things about like the cussedness of my people is our insistence on doing things that no one needs to do differently. Differently, It's the same thing with like the fact that we use inches and feet. And it's like, yeah. it's like, yeah, why, yeah. Why, why do we have miles and not kilometers? There's no yeah. point. We're just dicks. Like, but it's just like America. We can. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I kind of love you. We're going to do it way, different. You know? Yeah, it's just it's, so rude. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I I want to take that further. Like, if I'm ever in charge of this country, I'm just gonna rename ours. We'll call him Charles or something, just to like fuck with people a little bit more. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'd be horrible. Yeah. Now, uh, Robinson got in serious trouble uh, because of this football brawl, because a year earlier, in 2010, he'd have been convicted of abusive, threatening, or insulting behavior during a different EDL fight. Uh, so he'd essentially been on probation when the football fight broke out. He was arrested for breach of bail conditions later that year and jailed in Bedford Prison. While there, Tommy became incensed at the fact that the prison served halal meat, and he went on a brief hunger strike. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, for ten minutes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah not eating it. breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I'll never understand like the the kind of right wing obsession with like halal being something sinister. Like <laughs> no one cares, like, man. Like all the kebab yeah. shops on my area are halal. Like we just go in. And it's like, hey, boss, but kebab. Like, like no one gives a fuck. Like these people are yeah. maniacs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, I don't know. it's frustrating. I wish. Uh, every country would be better off with more kebab shops. It's the best thing to eat when you're wasted at three in the morning. Absolutely. Like nothing, nothing comes close. Just a big pocket of cow. Oh, I love them. Fat Donner. Um, yeah, fucking Donner with just everything. I'll dress that son of a bitch. 
Yeah, mm. I miss donors. <laughs> So in September of 2011, uh, after pretty shortly, I think, after getting out of jail, Tommy was convicted of assault again after he headbutted one of his own marchers during a 2,000-man rally in Blackburn. Lennon Cole, or Robinson claims that the guy was a Nazi, uh, and it's really hard for me to tell precisely what went down. It's possible the dude was doing Nazi shit and Tommy didn't want him at his rally. It's possible the fight was about something else. Um, either way, the whole fight sounds very silly, which I think is, uh, exampled by the fact that his form of assault chosen was a headbutt. Um, what's not silly is that EDL members during this time got up to a lot of much more sinister shit. Um, so as the number of folks who showed up at that Blackburn rally should tell you, by late 2011, Tommy's little band of hooligans had turned into a national movement. And the rise of the EDL saw a corresponding rise in hate crimes against British Muslims. Faith Matters, an organization aimed at reducing extremism, launched a program to track hate crimes against Muslims in March of 2012, largely as a result of the increase in hate crimes that happened after the EDL's growth. In the first 12 months after starting that program, they received 632 reports of separate hate crime incidents. 54% of perpetrators had far-right ties. Nearly all of those were either to the EDL or to the British National Party. Um, but numbers are boring, so let's look at a specific incident of violence from old Tom Robb's mob. In June of 2011, a bunch of activists in Yorkshire held a Rage Against Racism concert. The EDL showed up, and uh, I'm going to quote the Yorkshire Evening Post on what happened next. Two people were injured at Saturday's all-day Rage Against Racism event. One man had teeth knocked out. Kevin Barry, assistant manager at the well, formerly Joseph's Well, suffered a, an injured wrist during the fracas while shielding himself from a missile as he stood behind the bar. He said, A group of around 15 people, estimated to be aged between 16 and 23, barged into the premises shouting and chanting EDL. So Yeah, so the yeah. way they chant it as well. They do. It, they go e e e d l like that. Like it's just you. Mm. I've been at a, a rally before, um, like against it, like like covering it. You know what I mean? Back in yeah. the day, and you just hear it coming from down the road. It's just like oh, it's horrible, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, that sounds uh, foreboding. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's the right word yeah. for it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that's the goal. Now, uh, around the same time in Dagenham, two young Muslim men were walking down the street when they had the bad luck to happen onto a mob of probably drunken EDL men on their way back from a rally. One victim later recalled, quote, we were walking home when we spotted the EDL march. The next minute, somebody starts shouting at us, Muslim bombers off our streets. Suddenly, everything changed. I was pushed and five men attacked me. I was punched. I could see a much larger group of between 30 and 50 of them surrounding my brother. He was on the floor. They were kicking him and punching him all over. He couldn't move. I was terrified. I didn't know know if he was alive i think one of the or several of the edl guys later like were given jail time mm. uh there were like broken bones like pretty serious assault like, yeah, really yeah 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 those kids there's up. loads yeah. of those man like loads of loads of those like it just kept going on yeah i just picked two cases to kind of highlight what was going on because i don't yeah. want to just run through a, a laundry list of shit like that right yeah um fuckers man yeah, yeah, that's enough color on EDL violence. You get the point. <laughs> um, so let's get back to their leader, Tommy. In May of 2012, Tommy Robinson was caught flirting with a 15-year-old girl on Twitter. Uh, as oh. these things go, it was, <laughs> it was a fairly minor incident, and he was not charged with committing any crime. But the whole interaction is worth reading. A teenaged girl named Asia posted a selfie to Twitter, to which Tommy responded, You're pretty fit for a Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> uh the young woman who i think's name is asia or at least that's what i'm guessing from her um her her account name responds i'm 15 and you got the cheek to call muslims pedos tommy responds <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> how's it feel to be nearly twice the age aisha was when your prophet raped her and then adds muhammad was 56 aisha was nine now stop flirting with me Tommy. Okay, yeah, Tommy Robinson. Was, um, <laughs> thirsty Tommy is the worst yeah. thing ever. Yeah, mm. yeah it's pretty gross. <laughs> yeah, I can just imagine him though. Like he's, I laugh at him, man. Like me and my best friend, we um, we we watch him every now and then. Like we'll just sit there and just fucking laugh. Like one time, my friend, he was smoking weed. And he just put like Tommy's interview on when he got out of prison and like he'd lost a load of weight. And for some reason, it was just the funniest thing, you know, like he's kind of over here now. He's kind of like you laugh at him, you know, 
but like I forget all of this happened you know like now you're bringing yeah. it up it's like yeah EDL was huge and they caused so much chaos you know what I mean yeah, it's kind of nice that he's. I mean, obviously, it's better that he be a figure of ridicule uh, than than a leader of a powerful street movement. And I hope that's kind of where all these guys wind up. But I yeah, so. it is like for a time they were fucking huge, huge, man, um, massive. Yeah. yeah. Now you know what else is massive, Jake. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the gigantic corporations that support this podcast with their ad dollars. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's an ad break time. <laughs> it is. Products! And we're back. Uh, we're back and we're talking about Tommy Robinson. Now, shortly after uh, going to jail several more times uh, in early 2013 – or in 2013, Tommy began to pull away from far-right politics. In October of that year, he was caught with a false passport and found to have traveled to the United States under the name Andrew McMaster, using a friend's passport. As a repeat criminal with violent <laughs> convictions, he'd been barred from entering the country. He was caught at JFK Airport, and the whole incident added a wrinkle to the already confusing and winding story of what the fuck Tommy's real name actually is. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote from some coverage of that. When he arrived at New York's JFK Airport, customs officials who took his fingerprints realized he was not Mr. McMaster. Lennon was asked to attend a second interview but left the airport, entering the U.S. illegally. He stayed just one night and traveled back to the U.K. the following day to use his own legitimate passport, which bears the name Paul Harris. The court heard that is the name that appears in the EDL leader's passport, although he uses aliases. Sentencing the 30-year-old, Judge Alistair McCreeth told him, I am going to sentence you under the name of Stephen Lennon, although I suspect that is not actually actually your true name in the sense that it is not the name that appears on your passport. So again, I really don't know what his fucking real name is. It's probably Stephen Yaxley Lennon or Stephen Lennon. Um, yeah. It's definitely not Tommy Robinson. No, but like, so Stephen yeah. Yaxley Lennon is what, every, Yaxley yeah. Lennon is what everyone yeah. kind yeah. of believes it to be. He got yeah. he took the name of that other football hooligan, right? I think his uncle yeah, told yeah, him Yeah, yeah, Tommy to. Robinson. Yeah, yeah like his yeah. uncle said take it for some reason. I hadn't heard that, but that seems plausible. Something um, like that, yeah, yeah. Like him and his uncle were very involved with um, EDL at the start, and if I remember right, they were like, "You're like Tommy or something" because of the fighting, and he was like, "All right, I'll take that name" or something like that. Something weird, yeah. It's such a weird thing to do, though. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a weird name um, to pick for that, and like I guess I don't know enough about soccer hooligan culture to know why you'd pick that guy's name oh it's um, a very but, it's a very football hooligan kind of name um yeah. I, I, as a brit I, I i i don't even know how to explain why but it just is do you know what i mean he it, it is does sound like the name of somebody who would chuck a bottle at you <laughs> in celebration <laughs> yeah, of yeah. his team's scoring a goal or whatever yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, as a result of this passport fraud, Tommy Robinson spent another 10 months in jail. Uh, EDL members held regular vigils outside of the jail and called him a political prisoner. Now, Robinson's time behind bars was tough. He spent 18 weeks in solitary confinement because of issues with him and Muslim gangs inside the prison. They were worried he might get murdered, which is probably a real fear to have. Um, when he was released in October 2013, he appeared at least to be a somewhat changed man. That's certainly the impression reporters with The Telegraph walked away with when they interviewed him about his decision to quit the EDL. Quote, Going to prison was the best thing that ever happened to me, declares Tommy Robinson. I am sitting in a hotel bar in Lytton Town Center, listening to him explain why he has quit the English Defense League. Before his imprisonment, he had been receiving death threats from Islamists, neo-Nazis, and neo-Nazis were threatening to take over the EDL. As a result, he says, he was drinking alcohol, going out three times a week, neglecting my wife. I thought I was dealing with the pressures of the English Defense League, but I was pretty much just binging my way through it. So hmm. this, is, this is what he claims to be at this point. Um, Robinson told the Telegraph that his time in solitary provided him with an opportunity to finally look at where his life was headed. And that's when I started to question, where's the EDL going? Because, you know, we march up and down this country, but what is it we want to get out of it, and how do we succeed? 
Now, this article was part of a brief press tour Robinson carried out in order to convince the world that he had changed and was now dedicated to anti-radicalization. He started working with Quilliam, which is an bills itself at least as an anti-extremist think tank and is run by a former Islamic extremist named Majid Nawaz. Uh, now, Nawaz talked to Robinson while he was filming a BBC documentary after getting out of the clink. Tommy recalls, he said to me, Tommy, if you ever think about leaving the EDL and you want to chat, I'm here for you. So at this point, after getting out of, of jail from his passport fraud, Tommy starts to claim that like his time in solitary and his friendship with this guy Majid had convinced him that he'd been wrong to call Islam a disease and that like the, re- the real way to fight the danger of radical Islam was to work with moderate Muslims and reformers to de-radicalize extremists. Um, so he starts saying things that at least seem like they might be reasonable. Um, yeah. That's 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 kind of the the twist that Tommy Robinson's life takes at this point in 2015. It was a, it was a shock that I remember like loads yeah. of EDL types were fuming with him. Obviously, you know what I mean. But yeah. I'll be honest, back then I was quite young when that happened. But I did he did seem kind of genuine at the time. I think he he had like a very brief moment of um clarity and you know realized that like oh like this is radical Islam is a very specific thing it doesn't mean islam you know what i mean um but then yeah he didn't last long (laughs) no it did not last long uh and part of that is because in november of 2013 like a month after that telegraph article tommy robinson pled guilty to mortgage fraud um (laughs) (laughs) he keeps he can't he just can't can't stop stop. yeah Yeah. he can't stop committing crimes he just loves it like he's addicted to just getting himself in petty crimes like (laughs) it's just his favorite thing man it's so weird always petty and he's never any good at it (laughs) like how do you even do mortgage fraud like what yeah i don't i'm not gonna claim to understand the ins and outs of this particular case but the the basics of it is he worked with a crooked mortgage broker to obtain mortgages under false pretenses. Um, it it's ex- like the authorities think that Tommy probably made about the equivalent of about you know three hundred thousand U.S. dollars, something like that, about one hundred and sixty thousand pounds. Wow. Okay. Um, part as a part of this scheme, and the broker he worked with made about four times that much money. She 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 came out very well uh, other than going to prison with him. Mm. Um, now, this would be an entirely nondescript story of white-collar crime if not for the fact that Tommy Robinson is a right-wing extremist and his partner in crime was a mortgage broker with the name Deborah Rothschild. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, the Jews uh, are about to get accused. Yeah, yeah right. I mean, it, it, as far as I know, like I haven't found any evidence she's actually connected to the Rothschild family. And like to be honest, a, a crime on that small a level would be kind of small beans for yeah, it'd be a joke, uh, like the worst Rothschilds yeah. ever. Yeah, yeah, the, the very worst <laughs> yeah. of the Rothschilds. What well, you did a flipping mortgage um, scam? Like what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, I'm sure there were. I'm sure you could find Nazis in the BNP who like uh, got all conspiracy-ish about that. Well, they, yeah, um, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, like, I, yeah. I have heard before, like, um, on Stormfront, when I used to go in there, like, for research, um, and on Poll as well, they, they all call him, like, a Jew lover mm-hmm. and stuff. Like, they're really, like, anti-Semitic towards him because I think he even went to Israel and stuff as well and was, like, pro-IDF and stuff. Yeah, he's very pro-Israel. He does not, right. I will say this, like, he doesn't seem to be anti-Semitic. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, like that that's that doesn't seem to be one of the things Tommy has pushed. Um yeah, and he's clearly willing to work with the Rothschild, so <laughs> <laughs> um so uh Tommy was sentenced to another eighteen months in prison. Uh obviously he didn't do all of that, but he did a lot of it and uh much of it most of his time he had to serve in solitary due to the perceived danger again that he would face from Muslim gangs. By the time Tommy got out of prison, it was two thousand sixteen, the year of everybody's favorite election and a motherfucking boom period for the global far right. Robinson instantly discarded all of his prior claims of working towards racial reconciliation. Instead, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that did not last. Mm. Um, you, you might make that out as a case that, like, all prisons do is radicalize people. I think in this case, Tommy just saw that there was money in being a racist again. And yeah, literally, like, ju- oh, yeah, here's yeah. another chance. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, basically, as soon as he got out, he joined a group called Pegida, or Patriotic Europeans Against the Islamicization of the Occident. 
Um, is now, that what Pegida, it, the what? Sorry, the the Ossidan. Is that what? The, the, yeah, the fucking yeah yeah the, the Ossidan. F- oh, okay, right. Whatever. I know. I don't know why it ends in an A either, other than that they decided that Pegido <laughs> sounded dumb. sound like pedo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man, uh, fucking. I forgot stupid, about them. Like, they, they were Nazis. fucking clowns, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they were German, far, in, initially German, they mm, spread, but like mm. they started out as a German far-right anti-Islam movement, uh, and they saw huge early success, drawing in more than 25,000 people into the streets for protests uh, before a bunch of their leaders quit due to scandals. Uh, one example of that, a uh, picture surfaced of their founder dressed as Adolf Hitler. Um, surprise. Yeah, right. Yes, <laughs> real surprising. Uh-huh. Yeah. So all of that went down before Tommy was out of prison. Once he was free, he showed up to speak at several of their events in Germany. He warned attendees that the mass of Syrian refugees entering the continent constituted a military invasion. Then he announced that he'd be running the UK branch of Pegida. He started planning rallies, which led to one of my very favorite Twitter interactions of the entire Tommy Robinson saga. So... I found this Twitter post uh, screen capped on an archived Facebook page for the Midlands Anti-Fascist Network. So your own local anti-fascist yeah, group. Yeah. Uh, and this is from t- January of 2016. A user named Will Black says, Hey, Tommy, how is the Pegida March going to be different from the drunken EDL mobs you led? And Tommy responds, The banners will say Pegida instead of EDL. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty clever. That's yeah, actually that's, quite that's funny. Not you know? yeah, that's uh, not I, bad. That's not bad. Oh man! Yeah, but like also, like completely do. owning his own group, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, fucking hell, that is good. Yeah, yeah. That's not bad. <laughs> So in February, he held his first and I think only Pegida March. Roughly 200 people showed up, which is quite a decline from his 2011 numbers. Uh, many of those people bore placards that said Trump is right. Uh, the rally was uneventful as these things go, and Tommy's association with Pegida did not last long. Once he was out of jail, he began focusing on new fear-mongering grifts. On a new fear-mongering grift, I should say. One that was even easier to cash in on than fear of Muslim terrorists. Fear of white English kids getting raped by Muslims. During a speech at the Oxford Union, he focused on sexual grooming gangs from Muslim nations and accused police of allowing these people to rape children because they were scared of being called racist. Quote, we have a two-tier police force that treats crimes within the Muslim community differently. Now, when he made this statement, Robinson was not just referring to a vague conspiracy theory. He was hearkening back to a specific crime, or rather 20 years of crimes, the Rotherham Child Sexual Exploitation Scandal. Have you heard of this? Jay? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, actually, yeah. this is real. Like, this yeah. isn't yeah. A, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah it's like, a fucked he, up story. He, this is really, and what he said about the police being scared to report was actually proven to be true as well. They, they basically said, like, we were too scared to kind of investigate this for being accused of being like anti-muslim or whatever so it was a absolutely abhorrent abhorrent thing i mean it wasn't a muslim sex grooming gang as much no, as no. it was like i mean yeah sure like it, well yeah it depends how you see it. it wasn't like they weren't doing it in the name of islam they just happened to all be muslim but there was also like white guys in it that weren't religious oh, as yeah, well yeah. but it was whatever it was it was a horrific horrific thing that honestly got very little attention in the media and I actually, you know, I hate to say this, but I do think he's right that it was just the liberal media was too scared to properly dig into it, I think. Um, and unfortunately, that allowed the right wing to just run with it and just talk shit, you know what I mean, and turn it into something it wasn't, which then just re- the, wor- the the biggest fallout from this was that the victims didn't get the proper, you know, attention that they should have. Um, yeah, really horrible situation. Yeah, and we're going to dig into it a bit because it's a lot more complicated and and messed up than than Tommy wants to give it absolutely, credit for. Because yeah, like yeah. at what you say, like it, it, it one of the factors absolutely is the police, and not just the police. It's actually primarily not the police, but other authorities were scared of being seen as racist. Sure, but there was a lot more that went on to it as well. And like yeah, like you said, one of the big tragedies here is because it got so politicized. Um, due to a mix of right-wing grifting and liberal being afraid to be seen as racist, mm. like, I'll, everyone missed a lot of the really critical lessons about, like, why this was allowed to go on for so fucking long. Exactly. Um, so, uh, uh, do, 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 do. yeah, first off, um, this, obviously, it's a, a, a very much a real crime. Um, the total number of girls molested and raped as a result of the Rotherham trafficking ring was probably over 1,500 and may have even been sub- significant more than 1500 I I didn't even know that yeah it's a huge number 
Uh, a sizable majority of the traffickers were of Pakistani or other Asian heritage. And I should note here, in the UK, when people, like, the term Asian, when it's used, often refers to Muslims, specifically the way that, like, it's used in this context. And in the US, we don't really see it that way. But, like, they're generally talking about people from Pakistan and Bangladesh. Yeah, that's um, right. You and me were talking yeah. about it in Syria, actually. Yeah, right? yeah, like, yeah. Asian, for you, would be, like, kind of, like, I don't know, like, Chinese or... Chinese, or, yeah, Japanese. Right. Japanese, yeah. yeah. Here, like, Asian, you kind of mean, like, Indian, Pakistani, you know, maybe yeah. even Afghans sometimes, you know, which actually would make more sense. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's it's different, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here, like, I mean, we, we, a lot of times people will call, like, someone from Afghanistan, like, a, a Middle Easterner, which is like, no, that's not no, really that's right. No, not right either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so, um, yeah, uh, so yeah, a sizable majority of the traffickers were of, of Pakistani or, you know, Asian heritage. Um, but obviously the case is not just as simple as, as Muslims running a rape gang. Paul Williamson, the senior investigating officer on the operation that helped bring it down, uh, called the Rotherham Ring, quote, a unique and unprecedented investigation challenging in its scope and complexity. Now, he claimed a toxic mix of factors allowed the sex ring to persist from 1997 to 2013. Uh, one of the in like journalistic organs that actually did a pretty good job of covering this is The Guardian. They devoted a lot of coverage to it. And I'm going to quote from some of that now. Quote, he said a failure by police to listen, safeguard, and investigate the reports had led to a corrosive lack of trust among victims that the NCA was still trying to break down. Um, and one reason why the police failed to listen was, in fact, a fear that this would damage community cohesion and cause ethnic strife and be seen as racist. But this was not the only factor. The biggest issue with getting police to take this seriously was that these girls were being sexually trafficked, as in they were being used as prostitutes. And while, like, rational people can say that all underage sex trafficking victims are rape victims, not prostitutes, that does not stop them from being treated like prostitutes by police. Um, the Guardian notes, quote, and this is like summarizing the findings of an investigation into the abuse ring. In a small number of cases which have already received media attention, the victims were arrested, and these are the, the young girls, were arrested for offenses such as a breach of the peace or being drunk and disorderly, with no action taken against the perpetrators of rape and sexual assault against children. Within social care, the scale and seriousness of the problem was underplayed by senior managers. At an operational level, the police gave no priority to child sexual exploitation, regarding many child victims with contempt and failing to act on their abuse as a crime. Further stark evidence came in 2002, 2003, and 2006 with three reports known to the police and the council, which could not have been clear in their description of the situation in Rotherham. The first of these reports was effectively suppressed because some senior officers disbelieved the data it contained. So not wanting to be seen as racist was a factor, but based on at least all of the reporting on this, it seems like a bigger one is cops just assumed these young girls were prostitutes and were more willing to arrest them than to investigate them as victims of a crime because they, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like, awful, man. It's fucked up. Mm. It's very fucked up. Um, now, there's a very detailed government report on the whole clusterfuck, and it does, I'm going to read here what it says about issues of ethnicity and how mm -hmm. that played into the case. Issues of ethnicity related to child sexual exploitation have been discussed in other reports, including the Home Affairs Select Committee report and the report of the Children's Commissioner. Within the council, we found no evidence of children's social care staff being influenced by concerns about the ethnic origins of suspected perpetrators when dealing with individual child protection cases. In the broader organizational context, however, there was a widespread perception that the messages conveyed by some senior people in the council and also the police were to downplay the ethnic dimensions of CSE. Unsurprisingly, frontline staff appeared to be confused as to what they were supposed to say and do and what would be interpreted as racist. From a political perspective, the approach of avoiding public discussion of the issues was ill-judged. So that's kind of what they have to say is like the fat, like what sort of the desire to not be seen as racist played into it. So it was more of an issue in, yeah, like mm. once this was known, like the sort of inability of police to, to want to talk about it or get the word out or like deal with this as a, uh, as a like, like, systemic problem um whereas the difficulty like the reason that it wasn't caught for so long is sort of police bias against people they saw as prostitutes so again it's like this mix of yeah, toxic yeah. factors yeah just a real mix that only he picked out one thing you know yeah yeah 
yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it sucks. Uh, the whole thing sucks. Um, and because we live in the 21st century where nuance is dead, uh, the only takeaway from this story for millions of people is that gangs of Muslims are grooming and raping white girls. Um, this is obviously the line that Tommy Robinson has started pushing in his public speeches, along with the idea that the government is too scared to go after this people. And it's a line that's been helped along by research recently published by Quilliam, the anti-radicalization group Robinson worked with for a hot minute. They published a report in 2018 claiming that 84% of grooming gang offenders are Asian and the majority are Pakistani Muslims. Now, this report seems to mostly be bullshit. Ella Cockbane, a national expert on child sexual exploitation, called it a case study in bad science riddled with errors, inconsistencies, a glaring lack of transparency, sweeping claims, and gross generalizations unfounded by its own data. See, for one thing, grooming gang, which is what this Quilliam study claims to be about, is not a legal category. So there's no actual legal data on grooming gangs. There's just data on child sexual exploitation. And child sexual exploitation falls under a number of different criminal offenses, depending on the exact type of sexual exploitation that's going on. Um, one issue with their report is that the ethnicity of the culprit in these sorts of cases is actually only recorded when that person is non-white. So finding good data on CSE is very hard to do to begin with, and Quilliam never really tried. Their study was based on 58 cases they picked from 2005 to 2007 that led to 264 convictions, and they just counted up how many of those convictions were of people from Asian backgrounds. Uh, they provide no info on why they picked these 58 cases and not any of the other child sexual exploitation cases that like may have fit the same criteria as being sort of like a grooming gang uh, style, you know, attack. Um, critics pointed out that there were like, if you look at the total number of CSE cases that involve like multiple adults, there were way more than 58 during that period that were perpet like perpetrated by white people. Mm -hmm. um, and like, if you actually look at the data that exists, like the conclusion that you're drawn to is that a majority of perpetrators who in like child sex grooming in the UK are white because the majority of the people in the UK are yeah, white. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Again, that's like data that people use yeah. that. Well, all the all the sex people, they're white. It's like, well, yeah, because there's more white people. <laughs> Do you because know what I mean? more it's, white people. Yeah, it's, yeah, it doesn't work the same way the other one doesn't work. You know what I mean? Yeah. Basically, we have a huge fucking pedophile problem. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what color the, exactly. the pedophiles Kids are. Kids are getting abused. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You're right, man. Like, And these people are like, well, it's white. Well, it's this. It's like kids are getting fucking raped. Like, shut yeah. up and like, let's focus on that first and then worry about where it's coming. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's horrible. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fucked up and it's fucked up that like that's the whole discussion as right, opposed yeah. to like, yeah. I mean, and the reality is that like any of these kitty diddlers have way more in common with each other than they do with like uh, other people who happen to share their skin color because they're people who molest kids. Right, exactly. Um, like, yeah. oh, you're a Muslim? Yeah, like, oh, well, you're like me. Like, no, <laughs> like, no. Like, yeah. my Muslim yeah. friends are not pedophiles. Like, don't be fucking stupid. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, that's exactly it, man. You're right. Like, the only thing yeah. that they, they have in common is with other fucking pedophiles. You know, this is pure evil. It's, yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's just crazy how it has been politicized. Like, when you lay it out like this, it's really depressing, actually, if you think about it like that. Yeah, yeah, it's super depressing. And you know what isn't depressing <laughs> is uh, pivoting to ads. Uh, <laughs> of the back of pedophilia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Not yeah, the yeah. first or the last time we will pivot to ads off yeah, the back yeah. of pedophilia. It's not a Disney advert, is it? No. Okay. Well, maybe. I mean, <laughs> they will own us in about 47 seconds based okay. on, uh, yeah, so <laughs> enjoy uh, Disney+. Plus. <laughs> We're back! Now, uh, in 2017, Tommy Robinson got a sweet gig writing for Rebel Media, a Canadian far-right outfit in part funded by the Mercers, who are very wealthy uh, American uh, business people um, who like to fund far-right media groups. Uh, he received about $10,000 a month in salary from them, which he largely used to put out videos that he hoped would ignite right-wing rage about the Islamicization of England. This led him to Canterbury Crown Court in 2017. He showed up at the courthouse to film the defendants in a child grooming case. Robinson's justification for this was essentially predicated on the idea that law enforcement was too scared to bring these evil Muslims to justice, and so him filming these people was the only way to ensure that they got their due. 
<laughs> so Robinson, yeah, yeah, solid plan, Tommy. Mm. Robinson filmed for an hour or so and approached several of the defendants. This was all illegal, as the case was subject to reporting restrictions that expressly forbade what Tommy was doing. He was arrested and sentenced to three months in prison, but given a suspended sentence, which he triggered the next year when he showed up outside of Leeds Crown Court to again film defendants in a child sex grooming case. He filmed for over an hour, broadcasting confrontations with defendants and eventually his arrest to more than 10,000 viewers. This whole mess activated Tommy's suspended sentence and added another 10 months to his term in jail. Now, Tommy's fans have claimed that this was all part of an attempt to take Tommy down for his exposure of the dangers of Islam and the collusion of law enforcement. And (laughs) the fact that he wasn't banned from filming this event is like the suppression of journalism and free speech. The reality of the situation is that by doing what he did, Tommy nearly helped those child rapists get off without a conviction. Exactly. Um, Yeah, 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 because you, yeah. That's exactly where he nearly did the fucking donut, yeah. Yeah, there's a reason you're not supposed to, like, they're trying to try these people. And, like, you can't prejudice the, you don't want to prejudice <laughs> yeah, the jury it's against them. You don't want to. Like, it's, it's a con- big yeah, law. Yeah. He's mad. Yeah, basically, he gave them a chance to claim that it was, like, a, a mistrial, that, yeah, like, there yeah. was no chance for a fair verdict. And, like, they actually got a hearing at the Court of Appeal that might have led to them getting off for the crime because of what Tommy oh. did. Um, fortunately, they didn't, but, like, the only reason it was a chance is because Tommy showed up with a fucking camera. The best bit about um, that clip is where he's, like, yeah. he's all, like, boasty, like, he's acting like he doesn't care. And then when he realizes he's getting arrested, he's like, call my lawyer! <laughs> it's so funny, <laughs> man. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so, for a while there, up until this year, really, Tommy did seem to have hit upon a perfect grift. And he was well on his way to riches for out to, throughout 2017 and 2018. This is like financially the most successful chunk of his career when he starts pretending to be a journalist and like showing up and, and doing that sort of thing, provoking people, like making videos for Rebel Media, well, so ranting one, about one thing, sex grooming. Sorry, Robert, mm-hmm. I should just mention, I just remember, not remember. So you see this period of time when he was doing that? I actually yeah. spoke to him. I contacted him because um, me and my friend wanted to make a doc about him because when we saw him doing this like... I'm a journalist now. We yeah. were like, boy, <laughs> like we wanted to, f- I said to him, look, let us come and film with you. Um, you know, and he was like, oh, I don't know. Like you, you know, you guys are lefties or whatever. And like, yeah, we, we tried to get him to like, let us go and film with him. Not to like, we just wanted to do it. You know, we not to like, yeah. even, I said to him, look, we ain't going to stitch you up. I said, but if you do something wrong, it's fucking going in. Like, we just wanted yeah. to know like, what is this? But in the end, like, I don't know, we kind of went off the idea, but yeah, man, that was a crazy period. Sorry, sorry to but. And I just, it just thought, oh man, that, I remember like, I wish we'd got to film with him, you know? Oh yeah. That would have been a hoot. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, just getting to watch him get arrested. Yeah. <laughs> Um, which happens to Tommy about as often as like trips to the gym happen for a relatively <laughs> healthy person. Yeah, it's yeah. like his hobby, yeah. you know, his hobby yeah. is just yeah. to get arrested for stupid stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, in 2017 and a lot of 2018, he's making fucking bank. Uh, in 2018, he put out a video called Three Boys, Tragedy or Terrorism. It was about three young London teens who were hit by a drunk driver of Asian descent. Now, there was no evidence of malice or terrorism in this. It was, I mean, obviously, like, the guy's a piece of shit. He killed people because he was drunk, but, like, it wasn't terrorism and like the fact that he was drunk should be the evidence you need that he was not a hardcore Muslim um, but Tommy turned it into an anti uh, an excuse for an anti-Muslim screed anyway saying in the video quote it's clear that these families have been systemically failed and lied to by the police I can't be 100% certain this was a terrorist attack if this was a terrorist attack and cover up we could be looking at so many more terrorist attacks than we could ever have imagined so yeah, I mean, like, yeah. it's it just, I mean, it's it's like he's trying to find a problem yeah. all the time, you know? Yeah, yeah, I mean, because that's where the money is. It's like um, saying, like, oh, a drunk Irish guy ran someone over, like, was it the IRA? Like, no. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, yes, it was. Uh, I mean, I, I, I blame all car accidents on the IRA. Um, well, only the ones that go boom, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh boy. Uh, they, they've been involved in some Tesla-related crashes in Los Angeles recently. <laughs> that that could yeah. be the, um, <laughs> like, the, that'll be the future, you know, like IRA, like, rigging up Teslas, man. Shit. <laughs> 
Um, so there were, of course, demonstrations for justice as a result of these deaths. Uh, one of them even involved the mother of one of the kids who, thanks to Tommy, now believes her son, son was murdered and that his murder was covered up. Um, which, yeah, it's just, just gross. Um, he's a gross guy. So Tommy also self-published a second book during this time titled Mohammed's Quran, Why Muslims Kill for Islam. The BBC notes that he and his co-author opened the book with these lines. If you are a Muslim, please put this book down. We do not wish you to become a killer because this book leads you to understand the doctrines and history of Islam more thoroughly. So, yeah. Really? Tommy that's Robinson. what it starts with? Yeah, that's how it starts. Yeah. <laughs> Firstly, he's <laughs> presuming that a Muslim is going to like seek out that book. <laughs> and then secondly, like, oh shit, I don't want to become a killer. I better put it down. Like, Oh, oh boy. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> I'm glad I saw that disclaimer. Oh, thank God. I was God. about to yeah. kill. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> flipping out. So prior to the Trump years, Tommy had spent his whole political life, such as it was, as, as very much a fringe figure. Um, but he exploded in at least international popularity in 2017 and 18. His Facebook page hit more than a million followers, and for months he was able to use it to solicit hundreds of thousands of dollars in donation. donations. He was also very active on Twitter, tweeting this on the anniversary of the 7-7 train bombings. Where was the day of rage after the terrorist attacks? All I saw was lighting candles. Um, it's called a memorial dickhead. It's oh. called a memorial dickhead. Yeah. Uh, that how crass. Like yeah, that, the you know like the seven seven bombings and and also the bombings in Manchester where they those yeah. fucking jihadists like killed our children. You know like in yeah, this it's country, terrible. it was disgusting. What do you think we're gonna smash the place up? No, like the yeah, correct like, response is to have a candlelit vigil to pay respect. You know it's crazy. Yeah, it's yeah, it, and it it just is a symbol of like what a gross guy he is that mm. he's able to say like look at this horrible violence and be like, why wasn't, why didn't we just do more violence in the wake of it? It's because like, that's, that's not yeah, that what people, be brilliant, that's mate. not what sane people want. Yeah. 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 And let's, let's gather and make a really big problem for the police, which would then yeah. allow the jihadis to get through even better. You know, like, I don't think he thinks half the time he says stuff, you know, I really don't even think that he's like, I'm not saying he's good, but sometimes it doesn't, it comes from a place of just not even thinking. Like, do you know what I yeah. mean? It's just, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that that I would say that's fair. Mm. Um, so Tommy's shit talking eventually led to a very real tragedy in 2018, early 2018. A man named Darren Osborne drove a rented truck into a crowd of Muslims outside of the Finsbury Park Mosque, killing one. Osborne's journey to radicalization had started a few months earlier when he watched a BBC drama about the Rockdale sex grooming gang. He went online to learn more, and he found Tommy Robinson's writing about the sex grooming gangs and his social media accounts. Osborne signed up for Robinson's newsletter and is suspected to have indirectly quoted Robinson in the note he wrote out before the attack. Mark Rowley, the assistant commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, said that there was no doubt that material posted by Tommy Robinson contributed to the attack, saying of Osborne's rapid radicalization, he had grown to hate Muslims largely due to his consumption of large amounts of online far-right material, including, as evidenced at court, statements from former EDL leader Tommy Robinson, Britain First, and others. So, and this guy, like, this was a dude who was in a very bad place in life. I think he was a, a, addicted to drugs at this point. He'd lost his job. Like, it... it, it is that he's the kind of guy who you know most of the people Tommy preaches to are going to want to show up to get into fist fights. Um, yeah, this is a guy who decided to drive a truck into some people. It was a really yeah. weird one, actually, because yeah. like from what I read at the time, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure there were people saying like he wasn't really, he wasn't even like a racist guy. Like he'd show no, no. he just got radicalized so yeah. quickly. Yeah, it sounds like he was like either drunk or on drugs and like depressed one night and watches this documentary and it enrages him and he just like falls down a rabbit hole and decides like really within a couple of weeks to carry out an attack like literally it was yeah rapid yeah really rapid process yeah crazy man um, so yeah. so lucky that he didn't do more damage you know i mean like yes one guy you know god rest his soul he died but like yeah. fuck that was lucky that he didn't you know it could have been a lot worse could have been a it lot could, worse yeah. that's what i'm yeah. saying thankfully yeah. it was yeah it was not more dead um, now, obviously, journalists reported on this and Tommy's role in it. Tommy collected their information and tweeted out their names and social media accounts to his followers. Several reporters received death threats as a result of this. Tommy got messy enough with his social media and the way he phrased things that by the end of 2018, he'd been kicked off of every major platform as well as PayPal for massive and constant violations of their terms of service. He reported at this point that his income had fallen off by 70%. 
Now, like most right-wing provocateurs in the same situation, Tommy has attempted to rebrand himself now as a free speech crusader. His last post on Twitter before being banned was, The truth has to be told. I can't do it without you. After he was banned, he held a Day for Freedom march on Downing Street with the Breitbart London editor and Milo Yiannopoulos. Now, Breitbart, I should note, also received a lot of funding from the Mercer family. So did the U.S.-based think tank, the Middle East Forum, which, curiously enough, has fronted Tommy's legal bills for his, you know, illegally filming defendants in a court case and nearly getting child molesters off on a technicality thing. So that's who's paying for his legal bills right now, is the Middle East Forum, which is backed by the Mercers, who also backed Rebel Media. Um, now, it's unclear exactly how much money Tommy made off of his grift before the crowdfunding part of it dried up, and it's unclear if he's still receiving money directly from people like the Mercers. We do know that earlier this year, he put his $1.8 million house up for sale. The BBC reported that real estate agencies uh, agency pictures showed a Range Rover in the driveway, a hot tub in the garden, and a TV above the bath. So he did very well for a time. Although the fact that it's all on sale now suggests that, um, maybe he overspent, um, and is, you know, maybe he might be broke at this point. Yeah. Um, or he's just fucking moving. You know what I mean? Or like, he's just fucking moving. Or yeah, he just sure. needs more Coke. Yeah. Or he needs more Coke and mm. it's really expensive when you're in jail. <laughs> Um, in July 2019, as a result of a second illegal court filming arrest in violation of his su- suspended sentence, Tommy Robinson was sentenced to another nine months in prison. Before his sentencing, he sent out this plea to President Trump. I feel I am two days away from being sentenced to death in the UK for journalism. Today I call on Donald Trump, his administration, and the Republican Party to grant me and my family political asylum in the USA. <laughs> Uh, he he thought he was like yeah like Bobby Sands <laughs> you know like, yeah he really believed that he was this political prisoner he had a fucking t-shirt on I saw it on social media and it said the UK is North Korea <laughs> <It's> <laughs> basically like oh I'm getting sent to prison <laughs> like and then suddenly the UK uh, is North Korea like it was bonkers man and it said like convicted for journalism like it was convicted like, for journalism yeah, it's so good like. <laughs> He really went, yeah. like, he just jumped the shark. Like, he became this fucking, like, uh, like I don't know, just a caricature of himself. You know what I mean? And it's the kind of thing, if there were the slightest bit of, of doubt in anyone's mind that he, like, like it, it, if he had been a little bit smarter about how he got in trouble or something, he might have gotten a response from the president. But it was just, like, so obvious that, he no, you just committed a crime and you're doing time for the crime you committed. Like, yeah. even Donald Trump didn't want any part of that. <laughs> yeah, like, um, and, and you're yeah. wearing a T-shirt comparing, yeah. like, America's biggest ally to, like, the, you know, the biggest dictatorship going. <laughs> like, I don't, no, we no, like no. them now. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, Trump, yeah, <laughs> yeah he's a special like friend. That now. is true. Yeah, but he might change his mind in 10 minutes, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, Jake, that would be a nice, fun note to end on, uh, Tommy going to jail. But rather than that, I think I'm going to close out with this footage I found in an article by The Independent of Tommy Robinson that he apparently filmed himself of himself on vacation in Italy on what appears to be an enormous amount of cocaine. (laughs) Um, So we're just going to watch this video. And I I, I need my my listeners should know that in the UK, the word gear is slang for drugs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I just sent you the link. Why don't you click that and uh, and play it? <laughs> the thumbnail is already just gold. <laughs> oh, my. It's just like a big, like, <laughs> sh- he looks like a shouting bald baby in the thumbnail picture. Yeah, like he's got a head <laughs> yeah. like a bowling ball with, like, fucking gel yeah. on it. Okay, come on, let me watch this. Let's see, let's see. Stephen Yaxley Lennon. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Contains some foul language. Okay. Yeah, it sure does. Move over, because me coming through, and this is what me I'm going to do. I'm going to punch you in the head, I kick you in the face, because I am the king of the whole Islam race. <laughs> no matter where I've gone in the world, I score. I'll show you tonight. As soon as we get in this pub, I'll, I'm going to record it for you. I've gone to... I've gone to Qatar, bruv. I've gone to Doha. Mate. It's called gear of the sesh <laughs> while they're all praying. I've gone everywhere, mate. Everywhere. Every city I've gone to. When we went to Germany for the World Cup, I was like, see you later, lads. Where you going? Mate, going to he's, just, and then he's going it. 10 to the dozen, so and tonight, he, he, I mean, he's just... Yeah. I, I can almost feel the sweat on his forehead. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you can smell him in that video. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, he's clearly been like, he's clearly done enough cocaine that it would probably have killed someone who hasn't been eating cocaine every weekend yeah. for the last 20 he's years. He's the guy, yeah. you, you know, you see him at like 3 a.m. and you're like, yeah. right, lads, we're going in. And he's the guy that you don't even know. He's like, come on, boys, come on, boys, let's have another drink. And you're like, mate, fuck <laughs> off. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, get a taxi, man. Good God. Yeah, he's really, uh, well, I didn't even know about this. I'm so glad I found this. Well, yeah, you yeah, found it, this, rather. <laughs> yeah, it's I, incredible. Yeah, he play, He talks about starting a world war. Uh, and yeah, you, you get him like talking about how he wants to go fight for Israel uh, yeah. if there's a war between Israel. So, Tommy <laughs> Robinson. I love how he says, I'm the king of the whole Islam race. Yeah, yeah, what I'm do you even mean by that? Islam race. And then bragging about buying drugs in Doha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I couldn't score anywhere, mate. Like, oh man, like, he would go to jail for so long if they caught him doing that. Oh shit yeah, well, he like. would never, he would never see the bottom of that hole. Jesus, like, man, yeah, it's well. one of those things. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We call it like uh, gak. Like they call it gak. He's a fucking gak head. You know what I mean? Like he's clearly a big cokehead he does a lot of coke oh, yeah. man like i think yeah. one of like lauren southern or one of them ones like was saying recently in a letter that like he's just been fucking no actually it might have been i don't know but one of them was just saying that like they know for a fact that he just gets fucking high on coke all the time from all the donations he gets you know mm-hmm. and it's so expensive in england like cocaine is like i don't even know like what i don't know like 60 pounds 70 pounds a gram you know so it's yeah. a lot of money so yeah, he must be really off his nut. Yeah, I think he spent. I think he made hundreds of thousands of pounds, and I think he spent the bulk of it uh, on keeping his nose fat. I bet. That's I the bet. idea. I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. yeah. Which you know, if a guy like Tommy Robinson's going to spend money on something, uh, poisoning himself with cocaine is not the worst way he could spend the money. Mm. Um, mm. And it's not like if if I if I had to choose where all of those right wing grifters' dollars should go, some random coke dealer, probably better than them continuing to have the money. So yeah, I mean, fuck it, yeah. it's got to be better than like it going to rebel or all that shit. You know? What yeah. I mean? yeah, yeah. It's either that or they spend it on funding some armed militia in the u.s or whatever mm, I'll, I'll, mm. I'll, I'll let it go to a coke dealer um so uh this episode is dedicated to tommy robinson's coke dealer um <laughs> <laughs> yeah whoever uh, you are real hero of the story now jake uh we're at the end of the episode mm-hmm. and you have a very special thing to plug not just popular front but this fundraiser that you are currently running for it yeah, man. Thanks. Um. So yeah. So so my my platform, Popular Front, it's it's grassroots journalism, uh, conflict journalism, hundred percent independent. And right now we're trying to raise ten grand, ten thousand pounds because basically we all our equi- our equipment is fucked. Um. We you know we just don't have a lot of money to do anything with at the minute. So we're trying to raise ten grand to like buy new equipment, make everything more efficient, and certainly like the rate at which Popular Front is growing, which is rapid. I ca- I need some money to just go. Hey, like you know, bring people on board or whatever. So yeah, so we're trying to raise ten grand to make more content um, and put it out quicker, basically. So if you go to um, popularfront.co/10k, you can get involved there. And what Popular Front does that I think is so valuable. I mean, number one, you guys put out a lot of, or you, I should say, at this point, put out a lot of of really interesting content and valuable work at a very quick race considering like what a what a shoestring you currently Mm, operate on mm. and i can say that like my other podcast it could happen here like a good number of the things the details that i included when i was like trying to figure out like what a hypothetical u.s civil war would be like were based on things that i heard about in episodes of popular front like that episode you did um talking about like drone warfare and stuff and like how um, much that's evolved in like Syria with all these like off the shelf drones. Like there's um, the it, it's in really important work. Like it's not just um, like most war journalism. Um, it's either like too broad to be mm. super useful, um, or it focuses entirely on the stuff that uh uh I don't know is like what some editor sitting in an office thinks is going to get clicks. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think Popular Front provide like is way more interesting and provides really critical context on like how war is evolving in this this decade that we're in. So I, I think what you're doing is great. 
Thanks, uh, man. That's, uh, that's really nice to hear, especially from you, man. And yeah, that's that's definitely yeah. what we do. You know, we focus on the very niche things and we go into the detail that, like you said, the commissioner at the big legacy media won't allow their journalists to do. No, no. They're going to want another story about some ISIS guy. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so, um, you know, you, you, you do good work. Um, donate to Popular Front listeners. Uh, Unlike Tommy Robinson, Jake will not spend your money on cocaine. Absolutely not um, on anti-drugs. Yeah, we, yeah, it, it's a uh, a good cause. Um, there's a reason, you know. I went uh, with you to Syria. Um, we had a we, great fucking time, didn't we, man? We did have a great fucking time. Great it's gonna be a great time, fucking man. podcast. Yeah, man, I can't wait. Um, yeah, so uh, donate to Popular Front and um, Jake. Where can they find you on uh, on the on the twits, the the, the grams, the twinstagrams? Yeah, so uh, Twitter, I'm active on there. Um, it's at Jake underscore Hanrahan, which is H A N R A H A N. Uh, and then Instagram, I don't have a personal one, but we're on there. Popular Front, uh, Popular Front dot. No, sorry, Instagram. The Instagram is uh, at Popular dot Front. And when Jake says H, he means H, uh, fellow Americans. I don't know. I think um, I, I don't know. I don't think I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Robert Evans. You can find this podcast on BehindTheBastards.com, where we'll have all these sources for this episode. If you want to watch Tommy Robinson uh, <laughs> on a lot of cocaine for yourself, <laughs> um, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram and at BastardsPod. You can buy T-shirts at Behind the Bast or at uh, the T Public, and yeah, there's shirts. Shirts are good. Everybody loves a shirt. Um, that's the episode. Go fucking, uh, you know, go listen to Popular Front uh, or, or Pet a Cat. Um, ideally both. Both. All right. That's the episode, Jake.